Marie's Rogers TV. Focused on quality and convenience, there isn't much you won't find at Marie's Mini Mart. Homestyle bread, sandwiches, plus a variety of artisan breads and delicious single-serve desserts available exclusively at our Frecker Drive location. Marie's Mini Mart, with 25 locations wherever you go, there we are. My guest today has made a marvelous career for himself right here in Newfoundland and Labrador as a music educator, a performer, actor, <laughs> singer, artistic director, and founder of Spirit of Newfoundland and Labrador. He is the one, the only, Peter Michael Halley. Carl. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I like that introduction. <laughs> He's the one, the only. That's, that's I'm impressive. Glad. I'm glad you, you did. Yeah. yeah, it's great. So, uh, you know, you've been around for quite a while. Uh, everybody knows Peter. And um, I'd, I'd like them to get to know you a little bit better. Um, and uh, we're going to start off by going back to the beginning. Tell me about when you were a little kid and where, where you grew up, what neighborhood you uh, mm -hmm. lived in and all of that stuff. Sure, well, St. John's, born and bred, and uh, Townie, and we always called it the East End, but I, I grew up on Maxi Street, just off Monkstown mm. Road, and it was a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood of families that stayed there for what seemed our whole lives, you know, uh, as kids. And um, so grew up there, and uh, there in our family there were four kids, and then there was a break, and there were four others, so eight children. And I was in, I'm the youngest boy. I have a younger sister, and um, and so it was it was lovely uh, growing up. My father uh, and mother both worked, and we had someone come in to take care of us when we were kids. And uh, most of our time was spent, actually had a conversation with this, uh, about this the other day, about how difficult it is to raise kids these days. And I thought, did my parents have that hard a time? I mean, because I can remember we were just out in the neighborhood and when it got dark, we came in and we were out on our bikes all, t mm. all the time. It was it's just different life, you know, than, than what I mm. see these days mm. with my sisters and brothers' kids and their kids now. Now, it, I'm just curious, is Michael your, your saint's name? Were you named after St. Michael or? Uh, Peter Michael Christopher Halley. Oh, okay. In fact, my brother-in-law, John Harris, he's going to be so delighted I mentioned his name. <laughs> he doesn't ever call me Peter. He'll always say Peter Michael Christopher Halley. Um, Michael, yes, St. Michael, and then St. Christopher, mm. very Catholic. Mm. Yes, St. Bon's I, boy. I assume that, yeah. Yeah, Peter Michael Christopher, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, uh, so your school years, you went to St. Bons? St. Bons, as did my father, and um, is, I've been back to St. Bons many times for different things. I've sung the school song uh, for different events, um, and it's something that was ingrained in singers, non-singers, non-musicians, musicians. I have met people that have gone through St. Bons, and I'd say, on the hill she stands majestic. They will sing, noble to our view, and they <laughs> sing the song. Everybody knows, and then we'll go into the second verse, you know, friendships form within her portals. It was a really important part of our, our education, knowing the school song, and we sang it at every assembly and sports day, and so it's been a real honor to go back to St. Bond's on different occasions to sing the school song. Now, is that where your interest in music started? Uh, no. Or was that with the family? Uh, no, uh, I, I sort of with the family. Um, St. Pons, you know, we didn't really have choirs. We had glee club. There was a school band, but I wasn't in the school band. I don't know why I wasn't in the school band, but anyway, I wasn't in the school band. Um, but no, I, I, I think at home it started. We always had a piano. Um, in my house, it was sort of, the thinking was back in those days, the girls will take piano and the boys will do sports. So I remember going to my sister's piano lessons 
And I remember my sister playing da 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 and she would like make a mistake on this Furelise, you know. And I remember uh, discovering that I could go home after sitting w watching her lesson and try to figure out what where she was going wrong. So I play that song today the very same way as I did when I was a kid. By ear. Just by ear, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I just I just I guess I didn't realize it was something you know that was that other people possibly couldn't do i just oh there are lots of people that can't do that <laughs> they can only read you know i know i know the reading thing is is um yeah is fabulous you know um but i i always you know over the years hiring musicians yeah. i've always yeah. you know you read chord charts play by ear you read if they can do all and we have we're so lucky to have those musicians mm. here in yeah. st john so many yeah. brilliant ones yeah um, they're so well-rounded, um, but yeah, I grew up playing by ear, mm. and um, and then I, so they continued with lessons. My sister played violin, which much to the chagrin of our family pets, because they hated, you know, those pitches. And I remember this <laughs> dog growling at my sister. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd go to their lessons and um, and I play. And my father played and sang, and my mom played as well but very privately. I remember one time being in the basement and thinking, who's playing upstairs? And ran up and it was mom and she stopped. And I was like, why can't, you know, why wouldn't you share that? But she was just very shy. As mm -hmm. many people are with their with their talents. That's true, yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So were there any uh, particular uh, singers or performers that you really admired as a youngster growing up? You know, people you may have seen on television, in the movies, or on stage, or whatever. Uh, any of the shows that, you know, we watched all of the CBC um, shows, anything that, you know, uh, that, that involved, well, any show, but, but musicals, anything musical. Um, growing up on Maxie Street, uh, the house next door was used as the front of the house for uh, a CBC program, Up at Hours. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. So I remember yeah. that was we were brushing with fame, and we'd see the various actors come in and out. And and yeah. um, at one point, I remember we were asked to decorate our house for Christmas in the summer because they wanted to do some shots in the house next door. They were attached, had to look like Christmas as well. Um, but singers that I was, you know, my father used to get up in the mornings and play. Um, play his records. And John McCormick, you know, Irish tenor, he would play, and we thought, what is he listening to? But I actually learned to just love that music. Um, you know, we had records. We had a record player, one of those machines, you know, with the, it had everything involved in, in, in one unit, the consoles. That's right, yeah. Right? yeah. And uh, we'd have the 45s, the little yellow things in the middle and uh, the regular LPs, and yeah, Bay City Rollers, I'm, I'm dating myself now. Um, but I loved them all, I loved, um, like Frank Sinatra, my father loved, so I learned to love that music and remember thinking, I love that. Um, and I, I did have some people in the neighborhood who were musicians as well, who were very inspirational. Um, one of them is a, a doctor of music, Andrea Rose, um, she and her sister, twins, Emery and Andrea, mm -hmm. across the street, and their younger sister, Jennifer, um, all sang and played. And Jennifer and I were, were very similar in that we'd go to our older siblings' lessons, and we would come back and we would play what they were playing. And we seemed to learn at the same rate. She'd say, I learned this last night, and I'd say, I did too. And we were just little kids. But, you know, piano was a big part of our family. Whenever there was a gathering, we had a family friend, Sister Mary Edwardine, uh, um, um, Mercy's mm. sister, mm. and she would come and play. And I remember thinking, how does she do this? And she'd just play, I'm looking over a four-leaf, and everybody, my father would sing, and everybody would gather around the piano and sing. And that has sort of remained throughout my life, you know, gathering at the piano. Do you remember the very first time you saw, went to a theater and saw an actual musical? I do. I do, and um, I think it's an interesting story because our St. Bonds 
I don't know whether it was a music teacher, you know, that took the grade sixes or grade fives. We were bussed out. We went to the Arts and Culture Center, thrilled to go to see a matinee. Didn't know what we were seeing, but it was Oliver, Oliver Twist. Mm. So I think at that point we probably knew the story of Oliver Twist, but when it started, I was just, I remember being captivated and thinking, this character, Fagin, he's a delicious, you know, fun character. And then I realized that this character playing Fagin was Jim McGraw, who lived like three doors up from me. I had no idea that he was, first of all, able to do that, that, he w that it was him because the character was so disguised. And um, he was quite a few years older than me, but he was my brother's, older brother's friends, and are friends of my older brother's. And uh, I was just so impressed that he kept this under wraps. And I, I remember thinking, was it really him? And to this day, I still talk to him about that, how shocking it was for me, and inspirational, to realize that this person that I knew, that I knew was mm -hmm. up on that stage, and I remember looking around going, Wow, and then, you know, the lights in the ceiling. And years later, I saw you play Fagin. I, you know what, I did, I, I played that role twice. I and love that role. you did it brilliantly. Oh, thank you, I love that role. Uh, when I did it uh, both times, the both different cost, uh, makeup artists, Robert Power being one, um, I would say, can I not look in the mirror? And Robert did a, a rubber nose and would, you know, mm. glue it on so my nose was gnarly and, mm. and then um, little whiskers. And mm. When he finished, he'd do the reveal and I'd turn around and go, oh, I'm yeah. ready to go. <laughs> it's not Peter Halley in there at all. It really makes all. a difference, doesn't it? Huge. Yeah. I mean, I know that you do theater yeah. and you're, yeah. you know, yeah. and when you change into yeah. a character, that costume is essential. Yeah. That's you know, right. especially yeah. a character like that. Mm. And I've, I have gravitated to characters that are, like in Les Mis, mm -hmm. the Tenardiers, mm -hmm. you know, myself and Shelley Neville mm -hmm. wore the, um, yeah. uh, welcome, monsieur, that yeah. character. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah. yeah, love love the black teeth. And yeah. I remember we were so excited about when we got our costumes and our black teeth and our, the makeup. <laughs> and we we're like, this is so glamorous. <laughs> Not, but yeah. you know, we're like, when are we going to get our black teeth? Yeah. Um, just yeah, love those darker, yeah. disguised characters. It's, it seems to give you more freedom. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, I want to I want to talk to you about uh, when you first met. Kathy Hicks, which I believe was in 1997. Mm -hmm. uh, how, did, how did you two meet, and how did you come to develop your first show, mm -hmm. which was Hard Tickets and High Society? Right. Ah, it's a great memory. Um, so I actually met Kathy a few years before that. I just remember Kathy as being the gal um, on television with the large glasses and the long hair. And I remember thinking, I loved her style of interviewing. And um, she was very professional and um, seemed to be an interesting character. I'd never met her. Uh, I'd only ever seen her and then heard her on the radio. Um, and then for years, myself and whoever I was singing with at the time, because I've sung with many different people, um, first it was Gwen Carroll, she and I had performed together as a duo for years, and then it was Robin Sears, Peter Alley and Robin Sears, and then still, currently, Shelley Neville, and because um, we've always done that duo thing. And so we were playing at the Stone House on Canaz Hill, and I see... Which was a restaurant, right? It was a restaurant, and we loved playing there. We played there. We Brenda Power asked us um, if we would come down and play, and we did, and it went over really well, and so people were saying, so when are you back? We'd like to book again, because it was just like dinner music and it was fun. And um, we did so many performances, just laid back dinner music there, which was not stressful and was, and we learned a lot there too, mm. you know, learned a lot of music for that gig and sort of became really familiar. I, I will sometimes 
a joke about this orange music book that I used often there and knowing all the songs now in the book because of the Stonehouse days. But anyway, Kathy was there one day in the audience and I said, Gee, there's the gal, uh, the journalist. So after she left, uh, she left a note with the waiter and the waiter came over and, and it said, hi, I was here and um, you, I think you guys are great. Where can I hear you again? And this is my number. Anyway, I contacted her and we became friends. Um, and I remember going to her house where she had a piano and she played a little and um, she would say, well, just sing and sit and play. And a few times I'd invite other friends, Barry Galloway, who you may remember, mm -hmm. who was, yeah. And, um, we'd come down and play and sing and she just would always say oh i'm in my glee this is great we're having a big party so uh it was about that was about two years maybe before so 1995 and we just got into a conversation she was working as uh, one of the hosts of the morning show with cbc that's right yeah I was, yeah, yeah. yeah and she was up at four in the morning and i think she'd go on air at five or maybe four thirty and um, I don't know, I'm not sure about the times. And I was teaching in the school system. And she said, well, you know, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like, I go to these shows and, and I hear people say, oh, I have work tonight. And, it, and they, they're going to work doing their show. And I said, that sounds really appealing to me. I'd like to say, oh, I, well, I can't, I have a show tonight. Now, if I had a dime for every time I, I have said over the years, sorry, I can't, I have a show. Um, so that, that became a reality. We said, well, how do we do it? So we said, well, we find a venue. Um, you know, she said, can you write a show? And I said, I definitely can. And together we came up with the title uh, of Hard Tickets in High Society. I was actually in London, England at the time and we were calling back and forth and um, we were fooling around with the concept of hard tickets and then she called and she said how about hard tickets in high society and we can have you know these different characters mm -hmm. from each group mm -hmm. and of course that's what we did and uh, so i and it was a huge success it was a huge success it was uh, we went to the majestic theater yeah um, it wasn't at first a huge success. Uh, we had some press come down the very first night and do an interview with us. And uh, so it was myself and Shelley Neville. We wrote the show together and we auditioned people and just came up with this brilliant cast of people who became our friends. So there was Sheila Williams, myself and Shelley, um, Stephen Goss, and Michelle Doyle. Mm -hmm. um, and Michelle has, had just finished music school. Shelley and I had finished music school like two years before. Um, and so we became very good friends, Brian Way uh, or Ken Cooper on piano and um, various fiddle players. And we hired the Stonehouse to do our catering. And the, it was very, very successful. But the first, after opening night, we, it, you know, people weren't coming back. But they weren't buying tickets, and we were like, well, we gotta go out. We, so we went to Pippi Park. I remember going up to people's tents, knocking on a tent, hello, anybody in there? We have a certificate for you to come to this show. On the side of the street, we were stopping cars in costume. And something that we did that we didn't realize was going to work in our favor was we wanted the doors to open at a certain time, and when they did, we'd say, come in, and we'd have a fiddle player, and we, it was full of energy. Welcome, welcome, when we'd greet them in the true sense of dinner theater, we'd greet them at the door. And they would be welcomed with dee 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 you know, and, and people with big feathered hats and, and what have you, depending on their character. And there was a, an assortment of high tickets, hard tickets and high society. We had Georgina Sterling, the songstress, mm -hmm. the, the, the operatic diva from Newfoundland. We had a protocol officer because the queen was coming to visit. And so it worked really well because it was great energy at the beginning, but we didn't realize that people were lined up on the street and people driving by were looking saying, what's going, what's on, going in on there? there? Yeah, yeah. There's a lineup, it yeah. must be fabulous. Yeah. We weren't aware of that. So people were coming down saying, I wanna, I wanna be part of this. I wanna get into this lineup. <laughs> oh, it's dinner and a show. And when we look back at the original cost, our first poster, I think the price was twenty-eight ninety-five. Wow. 
for uh, yeah. for dinner and a show. Good deal. It was a good deal. <laughs> well, now when you think of it as a good deal, yeah. I remember we we struggled about you know how the price was, how the price point, and is that too much? And you know, but then you get you get a little bit more savvy with food costs. But, and but it but it really, it, I mean, it spawned a business, uh, Spirit of Newfoundland and Labrador Productions. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, how many years has it been now? Uh, 26, almost 27 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you have any idea, like, how many shows do you have in your repertoire? I mean, how many shows yeah. have you actually created that, you know, have been performed on the stage right. at Spirit? Almost 100. Um, wow. So we've rented some. We've rented the Buddy Holly story. We've rented the, the Nonsense 1 and 2, um, the Patsy Cline story. So so we go, uh, we go through... Um, the, the, the rental channels to to rent a script and a score. Uh, the rest of them are original shows that we've that we've written. So either um, I've written them by myself or with I call in some other writers. Um, you know Dana Parsons, Shelley Neville, Sheila Williams, um, Evan Smith, Keith Power now um, uh, has been working with us for a number of years. A fabulous talent. Yeah. And um, how long does it take you, Peter, to put a show together? We're writing one now for Christmas, so it seems it's it's a few months process. Mm -hmm. um, so we're writing a show now that's actually you know characters and it's a storyline. Sometimes, if it's a musical review, we start with music and say, and then create characters around that. But this is character driven. Um, it's a story. I'm, I mean, I'm just hazarding to guess here now mm -hmm. that for, for you, what you hold dear to your heart is the actual performance of being on stage, acting, singing, dancing, mm -hmm. and making that connection with the audience. Mm -hmm. That's what you really are all about, isn't it? I, th I think so. I love that part. I mean, I love the writing part, too. It just gives me great stress and anxiety <laughs> because we know that there's a deadline. People are like, when are we getting the script? And uh, my weakness is scheduling. Um, you know, uh, now when we start a process, I say, can everybody bring their books? And like Dana Parsons, her brain works that way so well. She's like, everybody take out your books. How is this? T and it hurts my head to, to think about you know, yeah, we, we have this space, we have this space with this person, but this person's going to be missing then. And it's, it's I, I want someone to say to me, Peter, you have to be here and you're going to work with this person on this scene. Great. Thank you. That's why stage managers are, are you know, mm. are great. But, um, you know, a small artistic business like ours, we're often thrown into every aspect. Mm. And it, I'm always marveled when I go into other theater companies, larger theater companies, and do a role like this past summer, I think, tell me what to wear, tell me where to be on stage, and I will learn my music and, and then go out and, you know, yeah, that, was, that's was, all there is to worry about. I was going to ask you, that must, that must be a, a great kind, kind of a gift to you to be able to leave spirit from time to time mm. and do shows such as you, you've done. You've done Les Mis, you've done Oliver. Spam a lot, um, and this past summer, come from away. Yeah, which I understand is going to go on for for another couple of years. Well, I don't know what the actual word is, but um, I am safe to say that it certainly will be back next year, mm -hmm. and they're planning on other years. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, where. Uh, whether the announcement has been made, but next year for sure. I know that the producer did mention it on our very last night in front of a full audience. So, um, must be a bit like a working holiday for for you. You know what? People were saying because the show is so high paced, and it and it is. I mean, you know, we got to exercise every night. But people were saying you must be exhausted, and I was like, no. I our regular jobs. Like I left work today moving furniture and painting and you know to get here because we're sort of back to we've mm. just changed locations and and we have to do that ourselves you know we have mm. to you know i'm going to leave here and pick up a liquor order you know and and mm. uh, get some things for the bar you know the mm. limes and you know so we're thrown into a million different directions and that's just the way it is you know mm. uh, but it is you're i liked your your uh, 
mm. the way you put it. It's it's it, it's a treat. Mm. Um, it feeds your soul. It gives you inspiration. Um, it's a, like a little holiday, but you're still working because those things. I was lucky this mm. summer because Kathy Hicks and um, Spirit of Newfoundland sort of. And Keith Power stepped into my role, and I was able to mm. leave and do that. Um, but yeah, it is. It's really. It was really fun. It is always really fun yeah. to step away. You've, into you've that. done Spirit in so many different venues, and I've often wondered. You know, I, I, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that you've worked in all different size stages. <laughs> is it difficult sometimes to kind of figure out how to do a particular show in, in this particular space? Definitely. If, yeah. When we go on the road, um, you know, sometimes we don't know what the venue looks mm -hmm. like. And so we go in and our, the person that has been working with us for many years, Adam Blackwood, who's a, an absolute treasure um, and works so hard, We'll go in and look at the space and go, okay, so how is this going to work? Uh, sometimes there's two stages and one is an elevated stage. So we, we have become very creative with, um, with uh, scaffolding mm. and black fabric. Mm. You know, you can make a black box out of anything. And then hanging lights on metal poles and, you know, mm. um, sometimes you just have to be really creative and, and not be too uptight about you know, we can't physically change this space, so we have to work yeah. within the parameters. So, so right now you're in uh, Gower Street Church. Yes. Uh, which is uh, a new venue for you. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with the venue. I've done things there over the years. I remember doing student recitals yeah. when I first started teaching. We're in the middle of making it into, uh, you know, a really beautiful stage mm. and space. We're doing bathrooms, you know, and, you yeah. know, the entranceway and lighting. And, and this, this is actually not in the sanctuary itself, but it's in one of the, the spaces. Yeah, the lecture hall downstairs. Yeah. So yeah. as you go around the back of the church, yeah. those are the, there's three different yeah. entrances there. And... Uh, um, so I assume people, you still have your website, and if people want to purchase tickets, they can just go to Spirit of Newfoundland. SpiritofNewfoundland.com and, yeah. and look at our website to see what's happening. And uh, yeah, we're still, you know, I mean, it, it really is an inter it has been an interesting life. Um, yeah. You know, when we talk about, we've had some people that you know, on our 25th anniversary show, we tributed because they had passed away. Mm -hmm. These young, mm -hmm. fabulous artists. We're sort of at that point where we can go back, mm. uh, you know, and do an in memoriam section, you know, and yeah. we think, wow, the shows that we did with him or her or them or, you know, it, it, we've done a lot. Peter, you're a Newfoundland treasure, a Newfoundland and Labrador treasure, I should say. Well, that's, <laughs> is our time done? Thank, our time is done. I was thinking we were going to be here all, like, <laughs> you, you know, when you think 26 minutes. <laughs> Um, anyway, there's so much to talk about. But Thanks so thank much you, Carl, for, for being on. It's my honor to be here. Thank you. We'll see you again next time, folks. Yeah, if you want convenience, Marie's Money Mart is here for you. A one.